Cobunga. Tubular. Uh, guys, it is my uh, absolute pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, a, a just a treasure in the world of comic books, animation, uh, nerdy creativity, guys. I am I'm so excited. Please welcome Mr. Kevin Eastman, everybody. Uh, Emails. I have you guys watching text some of my friends. Um, <laughs> yeah. He caught him on some work. Uh, no, I, I put together. We put together for last year's Turtle Story anniversary a slideshow. Some historical stuff, some moments uh, that you may or may not know about, and then a little bit about some of the projects that we have coming up. And then, we'll, if we have time, we should uh, we'll, we'll have a few questions at the end. So. Do you guys recognize this cover? Remember that? Yeah. 30, 31 years ago. <laughs> man, it's hard to believe that you know he's got it on his shirt. Good job, man. Um, it's hard to believe that you know, 31 years uh, ago, that we actually sold a single issue of the Turtles comic, uh, and it's even more insane that 31 years later, I'm sitting here talking to all you nice folks here, here in Edmonton. <laughs> we had a really wonderful time at the show, and uh, it's all your fault. Thanks for making us feel so welcome and having such a, a great time. Um, Jack Kirby, you guys know who Jack Kirby is? Um, you know, Jack Kirby was a, a huge inspiration both to Peter Laird and myself. Um, uh, you know, he was one of those guys that inspired me to write and want to want to write, draw, and tell my own stories. And so, from a nine-year-old um, up until um, you know, even today, he still inspires me. When I get a little stuck in a rut or something, I'll pull out some Kirby comics and feel that energy that I felt back when I was a kid. And Pete was the same way. He was a huge Jack Kirby fan, and the picture that you see on the right hand side on your right is a loser's page. It's a Jack Kirby original that Pete gave me back in, my goodness, 1985. Uh, I'd never seen a Jack Kirby original and it was just, again, so inspiring. So um, so we grew up big fans of Jack Kirby and uh, um, we, from the first time we met, we were trying to sell some cartoons to the same magazine. We both got rejected. Um, but we met and uh, we figured that we love the same kinds of goofy superhero and, and comic stuff. And uh, we decided to form a little studio called Mirage Studios, and we called it Mirage because it was a mirage. It was a living room. Uh, this is the living room. The house, uh, the picture before, was the actual house that the turtles were created in, uh, Dover, New Hampshire. And back in those days, I couldn't afford a desk, so I had this overstuffed um, uh, chair that I found in a yard sale. And on that chair with that lap board, I did this first sketch, uh, which was this one. Um, Pete and I were working on some ideas, and I had I thought to myself, um, you know, if Bruce Lee was an animal, what would be the silliest animal Bruce Lee would be? So the natural joke of it being a turtle was kind of funny, a quick martial artist being a slow-moving turtle character. So I did this sketch, and I put it on Pete's desk, and I said, this is going to be the next big thing, ha, ha, ha. Um, he laughed, and he did this sketch, changed a few things. Uh, I laughed, and so I had to one up his drawing, so I did this pencil sketch of four turtles, each with different weapons, and I put this kind of comic booky Ninja Turtle logo on the top, and when Pete inked it in, he had a Teenage Mutant to it, and we just said, this is the dumbest thing we've ever seen. Um, <laughs> and so we immediately got up, because we didn't have any distracting paint work going on, <clears throat> so we got up the next day and started coming up with a story of how the turtles got to be the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that's way back in 1984. In piecing the origin story together, um, you, if you guys know the turtles, uh, the turtles' origin is borrowed um, a little bit from the Daredevil origin story. Um, <laughs> but we basically picked uh, new mutants, uh, ninjas, animal characters, put them all in a blender, and came up with these these crazy characters. And a lot of people ask, where did the names come from? And this is actually a mural I did in 1980 in high school when I graduated. I was a huge fan of history, art history, and this is my tribute to, to Leonardo, da, Leonardo da Vinci. And so. What do we call these characters? Well, traditional Asian names seems most appropriate. Uh, not funny enough. Doug, Bob, Steve, uh, not funny enough. And I just blurted out, what about Leonardo, and Michelangelo, and Raphael? And Pete laughed, and that was a response um, that all, all we needed. So the last one, Donatello, was um, almost named Bernini. I like Bernini as a sculptor better. So coin toss, and we ended up with Donatello, which we're, we're very fond of. The first issue came out in 1984. Um, 
uh, I had a $500 income tax return. We cleaned out all $200 of Pete's bank account. We borrowed $1,000 from my uncle, and we had enough to print uh, 3,000 copies of the first issue at a local printer in Dover, New Hampshire. And uh, we were so sure that we wouldn't sell any, not one single copy of the book, that when we got the books from back from the printer, when we put them on a little studio, we made furniture out of them. We had uh, a coffee table, books, and an end table. But then you guys came along, and you bought all those issues in about two weeks, um, and that was a, a real treat to us. This is a poster where the actual first issue premiered. We got them from the printer just in time for this comic convention in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, May 5th, 1984. Um, again, 31 years ago. Look at those two guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to grow a mustache, I think. Um, but yeah, that was uh, Pete and I back in the day in that, that course with Comic Convention in 1984. Um, I grew up in, the, in Maine, and uh, I worked summer jobs. I cooked lobsters from Memorial Day to Labor Day. <clears throat> you know, saved up my money to, to pay um, uh, to survive the winter. And uh, so after the first issue came out, I went back cooking lobsters, and then that fall of 1984, um, I get a call from Pete, and he said, um, we still get, keep getting all these calls from distributors asking when we're going to do another issue, and we were like, we never thought the first issue would sell, so we never thought of a second issue. Um, and I always like bringing up number two, issue two, because we started working on that um, in the fall of 1984, and in January of 1985, we get the orders from the printer, um, and it was 15,000 copies. Um, and Pete did some quick calculations, and he said, you know, um, if we do 60 days a year, we'll make about $2,000 each per comic. We can eat all the macaroni and cheese we want. We can draw comics for a living. And in uh, January of 1985, issue two of The Turtles, I started drawing comic books for a living. And, and because of all you guys, I'm still doing it 31 years later. <laughs> so the dream came true. We finally were, uh, you know, Jack Kirby. We didn't know how long it would last. Um, but we were grateful for the job, and I could actually afford a desk at that time. So this is the studio in 1985, and uh, um, Mirage Studios was, was taking off a bit. Um, you got, any of you guys been to San Diego Comic-Con? The crazy show? Don't go. This show is much better. <laughs> we, can actually, we actually get to actually talk to you guys, and we have to fight through the crowds. Now we've had a wonderful time, but Comic-Con to us was, um, you know, there was a big show uh, this year that we went, and it was 1986. They were hoping for 10,000 attendees. Um, I think last year was 200,000. And so uh, besides having a great time at the show, we finally got to meet our hero, Jack Kirby. And this was, I think, 1987. And he was just uh, a big kid. He was, he, he, he was so awesome. He was so awesome to his fans. He was, uh, you could tell that he spent his whole life writing and drawing stories, and he had a blast doing that. And I said, man, if, this, you know, if I can be like Jack Kirby and continue to have this kind of gig, I hope I could be like Jack Kirby, and he was just the greatest. Um, Casey Jones, have you heard of Casey Jones? Casey Jones, uh, Casey Jones is one of my, uh, is a second human character that we added to the Turtles family. Um, I, I love that I had this uh, um, idea um, that all the vigilante comics around this time, most superhero comics were vigilantes because they had this really horrific backstory. You know, their whole family was murdered, or the whole city was murdered, or something terrible. And then they put on a costume and went out and uh, fought crime. And I said, wouldn't it be funny if we had a character that just became a vigilante because he watched too much bad TV? Um, so when you see in that first issue of The Turtles, he's literally watching three TVs at the same time. Um, these are some original pages actually from that issue in 1985. And I love pointing these out for a couple of reasons. Like Casey and Raphael are some of my favorite characters, especially to tell stories together. But you'll see this come up when we started working on The Turtles movie uh, a couple of years later. This was the first color cover of the Turtles. A um, couple of significant things about this piece um, that we could afford to do a color cover because you guys kept buying more and more copies of our comic. Um, we also, uh, it was the first time that I did the Turtles in color and I made all their bandanas red. Um, you know, I knew who they were, Pete knew who they were. We never thought of putting them in any other colors. Um, that comes a little bit later when we talk about the animated uh, Turtles uh, series. But I love this because Pete and I also were huge fans of uh, Star Wars. And so in issue four, we started this story where we took him into outer space. And so the opportunity to put all the turtles in like a, you know, Star Wars cantina battle scene was like, yeah. So this is our tribute to George Lucas and, mm -hmm. and turtles. There's a Canadian artist. Um, I don't know if you know him, a guy named Dave Sim. You know Dave Sim? <laughs> Dave Sim created a character called Cerebus. Um, and he was a big hero and inspiration uh, to me. 
Uh, he started doing service, I think, in 1976. Committed to do 300 issues out of his little office in Kitchener, uh, Ontario, and um, you know, it's a aardvark that ran around like uh, Conan the Barbarian, was kind of drawn like uh, Barry Smith's Conan in the early days. Um, but he was a real advocate for creator's rights, creator ownership and control, and, and uh, I had this idea to do this Turtles um, Cerebus crossover, and this is from Turtles number eight, and it's one of my favorite series because I got to work with uh, Dave and Gerhard who inked all the Cerebus stuff, and I introduced this character called Renette, who is a time-traveling uh, sorcerer's apprentice um, that I got to, you know, I bring her back later. So Mirage Studios was growing around this time. We were selling more comic books. Um, we ended up uh, doing some additional publishing. Uh, most of the guys, like uh, Mike Dooney, who created a character called Gizmo that we published, Jim Lawson, uh, Eric Calva, all those guys that had their own creative concepts. We published in Mirage. Um, eventually, they would work on Turtle series. And this studio was a great environment to work in because the creativity was abundant. And so were uh, those Nerf guns. So usually about noon, after we'd spent, <laughs> spent most of the morning drawing, eventually somebody would pull out a Nerf gun and it'd be this big fight in the studio where we'd just duck it behind their desk and bullets flying everywhere. Um, Pete and I, a lot of people don't know, um, uh, although Pete and I worked on every single um, aspect of the Turtles um, for all the early years, about 20 years together, we only did 16 issues together, um, issue one through 11, plus the four micro series. And most of the Turtle universe is built off that. And this is one of my favorite pages from issue 11, which is the last one that we worked on full on together, where we just passed the pages back and forth. And it kind of sums up the whole Turtle family to me. So I like to show that, that piece. Still working on the mustache there. Um, in 1986, 87, it was more like 80, early 87, we started getting calls from agents and, and different people saying, well, we think the Turtles can be more than just a comic book. Um, and uh, to us, we were, you know, you guys are crazy. We didn't even think it would work as, or continue work as a comic book. And so we started working on the uh, animated show and the, and the toys at the same time. Um, and that's where, you know, because we owned and controlled the characters, uh, everything that we did to change the story for the black and white comics, like adding the different color bandanas, Pete and I had full control over and contributed to every aspect. And Pete's, the, you know, Pete had the idea to come up with the different bandanas because the people that were selling the toys and making the cartoons is like, well, how can you tell them apart? And we're like, the weapons, duh. And, uh, <laughs> um, and he said, no, it'd be great if you could come up with another look. And so we had written the original black and white comic books for ourselves, so they were a bit older and edgier in their content. And this was being written for a much younger audience. And uh, so we started working on them, never thinking they would actually come out. And I love the, this is a 1988 when the, uh, uh, we were premiering the Turtle Toys at um, uh, Toy Fair in New York City. That June, the toys came out, and I love telling the story, uh, is we still never believed that the TV show would actually show up on the air or the toys would actually come out. So we went down to the local KB toy store in Springfield, Massachusetts, and as we were walking down the, the, the toy, through the toy store to the action figure aisle, as we arrived at the action figure aisle, this mom is dragging this young boy out of the aisle saying, no, I'm not buying you one of those stupid Ninja Turtles. And we were like, oh my goodness, what have we done? Um, <laughs> And so around this time, uh, you know, because of you guys, and thank you, um, you made the, the, the cartoon show a big hit, the toys were a big hit, and so they said, well, now we have to do a live-action movie, and we're like, you know, animation is one thing, toys are one thing, the comics, but how do you actually make this work uh, as a live-action uh, film? And thanks to Steve Barron, who was the director, um, who just did a masterful job, uh, and he brought in his friend Jim Henson to build the costumes for the movie, and these are some of the sculptures um, that we're working on in the early days in 1989. I love this one. Remember this scene? Pizza, pizza. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's still a lot of all the versions of the turtles. Uh, I love the cartoons. I love uh, all the different entertainment things we did with the turtles. But this uh, first movie was uh, was by far my favorite. And this is us on set uh, talking with the awesome and incredible Jim Henson. And I love this shot because it actually shows the technology that they had to come up with to make the, um, the bring the characters to life was literally invented just for um, the turtles. Uh, that's a puppeteer, and he's running the eyes, and the, some of the sensors you see near his mouth were actually moving the lips. So it actually, when he would talk and say the turtles' lines, it'd move on on stage. It was crazy. I showed you the Casey Jones uh, scene in the park. This was a mind blowing thing to me. First, Elias Cateus, I thought was the best, and still is the best Casey Jones ever. Um, yeah. But uh, 
it was a cool thing about what Steve Barron did is like he went through the original comic books and literally picked out scenes that he loved that were included in the movie, and many of them show up. And this was mind blowing because I had written the scene and drawn the scene with Peter, and then to actually sit there and watching it happen in real life and actually, you know, in the real world, it's just like, like wow. Um, through the history of the turtles, um, because. Uh, you guys kept buying all those turtle comic books. I got to learn how to tell and, and, and write and draw comic stories by drawing the actual comics with Peter, and also learn how to paint. Um, and see some some of my favorite colors covers from the early days, like '85, '86, '87. Um, it's fun. I show them on. Any guys seen the new uh, Nickelodeon series? You seen yeah. That? yeah. Um, these guys, uh, Nickelodeon as a company, did an amazing job. And my favorite part is. Um, they brought in this guy, Ciro Neely. We're, we're doing the press junket there. Not the blonde, that's her. Um, <laughs> uh, we were doing the press junket. Uh, but Ciro grew up, uh, his dad owned a pizza place, a uh, pizza parlor in, uh, in Philadelphia. And so we grew up watching, reading turtle comic books, watching turtle movies, watching turtle cartoons, and eating pizza. And then later on, on to, I think, create a whole new version of the turtles um, that's very true to the original version and uh, a great job. You know, as Casey reinvented, and he actually. Um, put Eastman on the hockey stick and Laird on the hockey pad as a, as a tribute to us. But the most important and, and most critical and critically acclaimed character in the series is Ice Cream Kitty. Did you know that? Have you seen that? <laughs> I'm joking. It's, it's actually, this was a, a great thing that uh, Ciro said, Nickelodeon said, we want you to do a voice for the cartoon show. You know, we'll come up with some really cool, you know, good guy or a really evil bad guy or something. And Courtney and I were at uh, Comic-Con a couple years ago and they showed this drawing of this cat that he accidentally eats. Michelangelo finds it and actually eats mutagen uh, that Michelangelo spilled on his um, ice cream cone, and he becomes Ice Cream Kitty. And I was like, "That's it. That's the character I want to be. I want to be Ice Cream Kitty." <laughs> and uh, they're like, "No, nah, no, nah, that's stupid. We'll find something better for you." And I said, "No, I want to be Ice Cream Kitty." Look at that. <laughs> and, uh, and I always say this. It's like um, I said, "I want to wear a T-shirt to Comic Con that says I am Ice Cream Kitty," and then make my or wife wear one that says, I'm with Ice Cream Kitty. <laughs> but uh, it was a lot of fun, and he, I'm glad that they keep bringing it back. I mean, Michelangelo literally keeps them in a freezer in the lair. <laughs> uh, any of you guys reading the IDW comic series? Have you seen that? Thank you. No, it's, uh, four years ago, actually, I can't believe that uh, issue 50 is coming out uh, this month. Um, four years ago, I started working uh, with IDW. Um, they... Uh, wanted to bring back the turtles um, to the older audience um, so the incredible tom waltz who's the head writer came up with a wonderful concept of mixing a bunch of the turtle universes into the edginess of the original series and for the last four years we've just been having the best time ever um, and you guys supporting it and letting us get away with some of the crazy stories that we've done and no we didn't kill donatello and everybody thinks we did but um, <laughs> read issue 50 you'll love it i like to show a couple of these this is how i work um in you know some stuff that you get to see behind the scenes i usually do a blue pencil drawing like you see and then uh from that i do the finished piece so it's kind of neat i can show you some uh, some stuff that you don't normally get to see out there in the, in the world um this one was great this was the final uh cover for turtles issue 28 which was the city fall series and Anytime I can talk IDW to let me do a wrapper on cover, and I can put every single character in there, and then Slash and Bebop and Rocksteady, and every, you know, there was a, a blast. Complete Turtles Mayhem. These are a couple of the books that we've done. Um, look for them, they're kind of fun. The Change is Constant is the first retelling of the origin, and then I started doing a, this is the first graphic novel I did for IDW, 60 pages of complete turtle wackiness. Mostly featuring Casey and Raphael, which is my favorite go-to guys if you want to do something really silly. Sillier. Turtles 25th, I know, this. we have to get that updated. It's like 20, it's like 31 years and I'm still showing you. These are a couple collections that IDW put out. The autobiography uh, shows a lot of behind the scenes stuff of the early days of the Turtles that Pete and I did together. And the 25th uh, anniversary collection is a collection of some of my favorite all-time uh, Turtle short stories. Um, 30 years, last year was the 30th anniversary of the Turtles. Um, <laughs> thank you. I always say it's, it's all your fault, you guys, every one of you guys that's buying those books all these years. 
Um, Simon Bisley was uh, one of my favorite turtle artists besides Pete to work with. We did this book called Body Count. And um, to bring Simon back to do this cover, I was like, <laughs> um, I penciled this and Simon finished it. So I thought you'd get a kick out of seeing how we work together. Uh, the next one is even cooler because that's I got to work with the incredible Peter Laird again. Uh, this is a cover, special cover we did for the 30th anniversary. Uh, I penciled it and Pete inked it. And this next one I love is because one of the ed editors at IDW, uh, they said, you know, I love that iconic red cover with all the turtles standing on the rooftop. But I always wondered what happened 10 seconds later. And I was like, oh. And so I did this piece um, 10 seconds after and uh, the jumping off to attack Shredder and Pete inked it. And uh, this was a blast. This came out for the, I think it was a convention special for Comic Con last year. Renette, Turtles number eight was um, a really fun issue, the Cerebish issue, where I introduced this character called Renette, and I love this kind of nutty, time-traveling, sorceress apprentice character. And I had an idea for a story inspired by um, somebody. And so I got to re -bring, I got to bring Renette back to the Turtles universe, uh, model it after my beautiful wife, and tell this really insane turtle story. Um, this came out last year, and I think they're doing a special collection this year. So that's kind of cool. This is actually the cover of work in progress for that. Uh, that collection. Again, you like to see, I love to do those crazy battle scenes and stuff. Turtles issue 50, again, I still can't believe it. This is my cover, one of the covers that are coming out for the Turtles issue 50, which I think is at, literally at the printer right now. Um, I got to do a bunch of different covers for this, including a Jack Kirby collaboration, and then this one was really fun. Um, do you guys know who Robert Rodriguez is? Little director, yeah. he's done Sin City and Desperado. He's a, been a longtime friend, and he a lot of people don't know he can really draw and really well. Um, so I was visiting him once uh, recently, and I said, "Hey, if I pencil a turtle cover, would you ink it, and we'll put it on Turtles issue 50?" So that's my pencils, Robert Rodriguez's inks uh, in the middle, and then the, the colorist uh, that I've been working with, Tony, did the color, and that'll be a special variant cover um, for Turtles issue 50. And we're actually we're signing it in New York, um, at New York Comic Con. Next, oh, two weeks. <laughs> Here's a sneak peek of issue 51 and 52 um, uh, that I thought you'd get a kick out of seeing. We're taking the turtles into a whole new level of insanity and fun stories, and uh, I hope you get a chance to, uh, uh, to check those out after you see 50 and realize Donatello's okay. <laughs> this is kind of nutty. This is kind of fun. Uh, you guys, oh, you broke it. You guys, uh, we're doing a crossover. You guys here, we're doing the Turtles Batman crossover. Yep. It's kind of nutty that, you know, all those years of being a kid and wanting to work for Marvel at DC, uh, you know, that dream was always uh, there. But, you know, then I got distracted for 30 years working on Turtles. Um, and we had a conversation with DC last year. Would it be great uh, to do a Turtles Batman crossover? And you guys are going to love it. It's just all out awesome mayhem ninjas and turtles and batmans and stuff uh, so this is a sneak peek this is the cover of uh, the first issue is coming out in november um, i've got two other projects i've got coming out from idw um, this year one is fistful of blood which i did with simon bisley it's zombies vampires complete nutty mayhem and and funnery uh, only as me and simon could do and then los angeles is a new series i'm doing that starting next spring I'm still going to be doing all my regular turtle work, uh, all the covers I work with, uh, co-writing and doing all that. But these are two other fun things I've been work waiting to do for ooh, about 10 years. So uh, look for those. They're, they're kind of fun. Not, not for all ages, but some are still kind of fun. We always have a blast. I always like to end with this piece. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we love doing the shows, we love getting out there, we love meeting you guys. These are some awesome gifts that some fans brought us uh, to an Arizona show. Uh, so we wore them for about 20 minutes, so we started sweating too much. <laughs> so, but it was a blast. And uh, there's me in the studio. I finally gave up on the mustache, and now I just draw turtles. It's all your fault. So. Thanks. That's a little bit of turtle history. And, uh, um, but, yeah, 15 minutes. Awesome. Great. Um, so we have 15 minutes of questions. I think the microphone uh, is live in the center. Is that right? Uh, and then if you guys want to step up and ask any questions, or if you don't, I can just do, <coughs> get back to my emails. No. <laughs> no, if you have any questions, I'd love to, to, to chat you yeah, some more.
And you too, this is a friend, the moderator over here. We put him out of a job today. Yeah, <laughs> Just watch the panel. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, hello, Mr. Eastman. Hi. Hi. Uh, just a quick aside. I, I volunteered for the Kirby Museum, the local bit here. So, also Kirby Ken, and also it's really promoting him and his influence. Absolutely, he's such a huge influence. Of course. So. Hello. Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, the Ninja Turtles was the first comic book that I started seriously collecting back in the '80s. It was the first comic book that I bagged and bored and put away. Um, awesome. So I have an extreme bias for uh, the red bandana turtles mm -hmm. and that style and that influence. Right. Um, and it's great to see uh, Nickelodeon and, and IDW projects sort of um, paying homage to that um, that mythos. And I was wondering, have there been any um, false starts or cancel projects, or is there any ambition? Um, to do something new just in that continuity and with those that that mythos and those characters. Well, it's you know it's it's so weird sometimes because uh, I feel like there's there's so many different turtle universes over the years. We look at the original black and white series was what Pete and I created, and then when we adapted them into the the cartoon series, it was you know based on uh, our idea, but it was for a younger audience. And there was a lot of different characters that came in to play there that you never saw in the in the black and white comics. Um, Right through the the different movies and you know the 2007 animated series, the 2000 Fox Kids series, again different variations on the Turtle universe. And now it's I feel like we're back in the same place where we've got the IDW comic books, which are again for intended for an older audience. But what Tom did in his construction of the new Turtles, so I call it the IDW universe, is he picked you know characters from all the Turtle universes. So we have neutrinos from the cartoon show. Um, brought back in, but we made them, you know, these tough freedom fighters battling the Krang, and, uh, you know, it's different to, to pick, um, you know, Rat King's back, and Leatherhead's coming up in the new series, so it's great to pick from those different universes and have this foundation where we can tell um, new and interesting stories that don't deviate from what the fans love, and, you know, that's, that's our biggest worry is uh, we do something you guys hate us, like, everybody thought we killed Donatello for... <laughs> last couple of months. Um, but no, I, I'd love to see, you know, then we have the Nickelodeon animated series, which is still very much written in the same way. It's based on a lot of turtle, different turtle universes into this new turtle universe and what Ciro's doing is fantastic. And um, I know you guys really love the, the, the Michael Bay movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, <laughs> the parts with the turtles in it are great. It's yeah, they, I know. I'm you know, it's just so funny because like, people give me a hard time about two things. One is the Venus de Milo character, which they hated the girl turtle, um, which I worked on, which actually was based on an idea for a fifth turtle, male turtle, for the fourth movie that New Line was going to make that never got made um, in Kirby, and then it could turn into a female turtle for Fox. Um, but no, we worked really hard on the on the on the um, Jonathan Leib's been Paramount movie that came out last year. And there's some really great stuff in there. I think there's some really funny bits. Um, there's some bits. Even the director, Jonathan, was just adamant. I had tons and tons of meetings with him, and he said, I want to make the best Turtle movie ever. Um, sometimes studios have different ideas, um, and he couldn't do some of the things he wanted to, but um, I know they're working on a new one now, and I think it'll be truer to the, the original Turtles, but it was, it was some fun stuff. So I'd love to see a, a movie based on the Turtles IDW universe, I think. So, thanks a lot. Thanks. You know, the, the size of the original comic books, issues one through four and Raphael were done oversized. And what happened was, um, long story short, is when we, uh, we found this local printer in Dover, New Hampshire, and um, they printed this magazine. It was called TV Facts. And it was one of those free deuce print things they used to leave around in convenience stores. And um, so we took our comic we, to the printer. You thought it was so weird. What are these kids doing? And a uh, two color cover. Uh, we wanted it on newsprint. That's exactly what we could afford. And so we gave him all the stuff. He printed it. We went to pick it up. It was oversized. We were like, you were supposed to make it comic size. And he said, well, you didn't tell me. That. <laughs> so that's why all the oversized books are done. The early books were done oversized, which I actually like. I think it was a, it was a great thing. But then we would get so many complaints from retailers saying we can't put these in comic bags, we can't do this, and you know fans would say I can't fit them in my comic boxes, and so we sort of succumbed to overwhelming uh, pressure. And so starting with issue five, we went to regular comic book size, and that's that's the way they've been ever since. So to me, it's 
it was cool, it's great for the fans, but um, it makes those earlier issues even cooler. So, thank you. Um, why at first, when you started adding color, why were all the masks red? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, we did the turtle mask red because to me it was like, I don't know, it just felt like the right color, like ninja, I don't know, it just red seemed to fit him and I was, you know, red and green together um, just seemed to work uh, perfectly. And I, you know, both Peter and I could tell who, tell them apart. Um, even in the black and white comic book, we, you know, it got tough sometimes because we did always be holding a weapon. So we knew that, you know, Raphael was the Psy and Michelangelo was the nunchucks and we try to do the personality. Um, so we, we thought it'd be fun and we kept him uh, with red bandanas for most of the, all the original, and all the original black and white comics and, and even afterwards. When we started working on the animated show, we uh, thought it would be fun to be able to tell them apart a little bit more. So um, we came up with uh, orange Michelangelo because it's kind of a silly color. Uh, red is Raphael because he's kind of our, our bad guy, our Wolverine character. So we kept him in the original red. Leonardo uh, blue is kind of a regal, uh, you know, leader-like color, you know, samurai, katana swords. And then Donatello is the purple is kind of a more peaceful, pacifist sort of style color and more of a monk-like thing. And Donatello with the staff is what we chose that. So the colors we picked were with purpose, but uh, yeah, I still like the original red bandanas too. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. Awesome. Hey, Kevin. How are you, dude? Love the shirt. Oh, thank you. Awesome. I actually met you in Calgary uh, last year. Oh, awesome to see you again. Yeah. Thanks. And I'm glad you're in my hometown. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first, um, when you showed that picture of Cerebus, um, mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that looks a lot like Rocksteady. Mm -hmm. Is that a coincidence? That, that Cerebus looks like Rocksteady? Yeah. You know, it's, it was... Um, you know, it's funny that even you know you look at um, the early drawings of Cerebus because he's an aardvark, and that doesn't look anything like an aardvark. <laughs> and, and you watch it, but there's some of the early issues he had a longer snout, and you know as things sort of are defined and refined as as the characters get older. Um, but with the the different mute characters, we started working on a role playing game, um, Turtles and Other Strangeness. Um, and that's the first place we started introducing lots of other mute characters. So you literally went down a list of. You know, okay, rhinoceros, uh, warthog, um, you know, terror bears, I think, one of the characters. And so uh, it was probably with some subliminal influence, influence, but it's like, you know, trying to adapt these characters into uh, mutant sort of semi-human characters is always a challenge, and then being able to draw them regularly, too. So Nice. Yeah. Um, my second question. Uh, so have you heard the story about Axl Rose being cooped up backstage watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2? <laughs> I absolutely heard that. It's like, and I think it was, in a, it was in an article recently, and I forget where, I was on a plane or somebody, maybe it was on an internet post, but they said he actually held up a concert um, that he's yep. supposed to be on stage doing something. It's like two watching. hours late, just watching a movie. <laughs> That's, bless his buttons. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Have a good one. Thank you. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Um, my name is Jason. My dad really likes your comics. Thank you so much. That's really kind. Um, I have two questions. Okay. Um, the first one is, wh what do you feel like when you make these comics? What, say that again, please. What do you feel like when you make these comics? I feel like um, someone about your age in this 53-year-old body just having the best time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel very happy. Um, it brings me, you know, it's, it's funny because it's, um, drawing comic books is, uh, it's very personal. It's something I love from a very young age. Uh, I love writing and creating my own stories, telling my own stories. Um, it's a commitment. It's like, you know, basically I sit in my studio, you know, hour after hour, day after day, um, in my own little world, um, just creating and drawing. In fact, uh, Courtney and I, we have a son that's nine years old. And uh, he still doesn't think I have a real job. And he's like, Dad, you just go, you know, I have to go to school and I have to do homework and I have to do this stuff. You just stay home and draw turtles all day long. And, uh, but uh, no, I love it. It's, it makes me feel just, uh, makes my heart happy. And, you know, it's like coming to a show like this and meeting, you know, all you folks. It gives me such great energy. It makes all those long hours and long nights um, even more special. Um, my second question is, um... Why do you make comics? 
Well, you know, it's it's funny that because um, it's when you today there's so many different um, entertainment options. Um, you have uh, like our son plays Minecraft, and he sometimes he'll read comic books or watch stuff on his iPad, and he does all these different things because he's not doing sports. And when um, I started out, we didn't have any of that. We uh, we didn't. There was no cell phones, no fax machines. Our TV was in black and white. <laughs> Um, and I had a paper route, and uh, uh, every every month I'd get make about a dollar fifty um, from uh, delivering papers, um, and the comic books were twenty cents a piece back then. That's how old I am. <laughs> and so I would be able to buy um, basically um, about five comic books, a Twinkie, and a YooHoo, and uh, that's what I do that every month, and I'd read comic books. So that was a big thing in my life. That was um, I love the the fact that if you could think about it. And you could draw it, then you could make up any kind of story, pirate stories, Tarzan stories, Star Trek stories, um, mutant turtle stories, whatever you could think of, you could tell your own story. And to me, that was fantastic. So that's what really inspired me to, to, to tell stories. Thank you. Is it Jason, right? Yeah. Thank you. That was a really wonderful question. Thank you so much. Hi, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Mike, and I just wanted to let you know um, that uh, how much influence you've had, not only of myself, but of my whole family, because me and my brother grew up with Ninja Turtles, fighting, wrestling, <laughs> playing with the toys, and now my nephews, who are five and seven, are doing the exact same thing, except for I don't let them play with my toys. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but one quick story I wanted to just share with you was uh, my brother actually uh, loved Ninja Turtles so much he got into Kung Fu, and from there he got into being like a master of Kung Fu. Awesome. And now today he um, works with the RCMP in the depot, training the RCMP across Canada to be awesome. a police officer. So I just thought you might want to know how kind of far and wide your influence goes. Yeah. Five minute, uh oh, five minute warning. And no, so, no, but it's funny, no, it's not to, I want to hear your question, but that, that to me is, a, it's really special and thank you. And that's a, it's a huge honor. I take that very seriously. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, my other question is, because he's a Kung Fu master and you basically are writing a book about Kung Fu, how do you get your inspiration for your ninja moves, your fighting styles? Like, where does that all come from? That's a great question. And it's, it's so funny because um, when we were younger, uh, when we, the first Turtles first started, we were doing interviews and stuff, and people were like, oh, Ninja Turtles, martial arts, you guys, what, are you guys black belts or something? And we're like, well, if uh, being black belts mean that we've watched every Bruce Lee movie made and uh, <laughs> all the David Carradine Kung Fu TV series. And I grew up in Maine, and, and I remember when we got cable, which was awesome, um, and uh, they used to do this martial arts theater on one of the cable channels out of Boston. So all Saturday afternoon, I'd be you know, watching wrestling and then all these martial arts movies. So... Um, when we did the first issue of the Turtles, I had never been to New York City, and I knew nothing more about martial arts than watching Bruce Lee movies and <laughs> martial arts movies. Um, so I just made it up. So we just kind of figured, like, you know, action, reaction. Um, and then as we got into the second issue and third issue, we actually, you know, Peter and I went to the library, and we did as much research as we could find on how to hold a sword and hold size and, and do that stuff. Um, but it was just funny. I just remembered, like, doing a comic book that takes place in a city I've never been to about um, these martial arts turtles, turtles that I knew nothing about, <laughs> nothing about. And you just wing it and hope for the best. Um, but it's, it's funny, it's like uh, years later, I, I did martial arts for about 10 years and uh, I should, you know, I should eat, be eating less pizza, doing more martial arts now. Um, but I studied, uh, um, you know, Aikido and Savat and Muay Thai and, and, and so many different forms. And until you do that, it's um, you don't realize how amazing it is, uh, not only for the physical activity, but the discipline and the control and, and really understanding what these guys uh, can do and how important it is. And, you know, even um, what's funny is uh, we are friends with, uh, been longtime friends with Ernie Reyes Jr., who was Kino in the, he actually wore the Donatello costume in Turtles movie one. He was Kino in, Don in Turtles number two. Um, and he uh, grew up as uh, a child actor. Um, he did a TV show called Psychics when he was younger uh, and stuff. But his dad ran martial arts studios, and he said the same thing. He said when the first Turtles movie came out, he said, lines uh, with kids are on the block everywhere um, just wanting to learn martial arts. And it, was, and it was great, and I take it as such a 
compliment because it is um, they learn the physicality they learn about you know being healthy and taking care of your body and, and you know even controlling your, your anger and, and discipline because uh, martial arts is not a, 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 a it's not made for regression it's just sort of made for you know mind and all that stuff so um, man I answered I take a long time to answer all these questions don't I? <laughs> yeah, I'm the last one so my wife's over there going shut up, shut up. <laughs> thank you again for everything hey um, I think we're going to wrap up uh, all your questions are great and I have to say uh, again thank you so much for feeling uh, uh, for us uh, making us feel so welcome you know, we've had such a wonderful time we've done I think eight hours or nine hours of signing and we've done photo ops and then this panel has just been been great we're going back to um, I think we're doing he has all the information, so so I don't mess it up. <laughs> He's going to give you the information. Um, but I just want to say uh, this has been incredible. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming to the panel. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. I'll see you soon.